1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. Father, we just come before you and we thank you. I just, I just am so thankful for the word. I am so thankful, God, that you had a great and a fantastic and a magnificent plan, that it's right on course, that it's coming to pass right before our eyes. And that plan includes blessing, that the blessedness of God would rest on your people to witness to a world that's spinning out of control. And so I'm asking you, God, to just quicken this word in our spirit Help us to stay in tune. Help us to stay in tune with what you're doing and just minister to us, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Let's stand for the reading of the words. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. However, we speak among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known them, they would have not crucified the Lord. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except by the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things are, we also speak, not in words of man's wisdom teaches, but with the Holy Spirit, what, which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But we, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? We have, because we have the mind of Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. You may be seated. I need to go over some basic principles that we teach here a lot to make sure you get this part before we go into this revelation that God has given me. And I've taught this often, and you need to get it. The spirit knows, but the mind proves. The spirit knows, but the mind proves the will of God. 1 Corinthians 2.12 said, it's by the spirit that we know the things of God. There is no way that you're going to know God, understand God, perceive his kingdom, discern what he's doing, have some communication with him any other way except by the Spirit. When God created you in Genesis chapter 3, he took the elements of the earth, the dust, he formed the body, he breathed his spirit into man, and the man formed a living soul. The soul became the interface between the spirit and the body. And so you're, God is three in one. You're made in his image. You're three in one. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You are body, soul, and spirit. You have three components that make up who you are. And they're, they're important that they interact together. But in, in the garden before Adam fell, he was a spiritual man. He was led by his spiritual nature. His spiritual nature was his most dominant nature. And that's how he stayed in tune with God. He was totally self-unaware. He had no idea that he was naked and didn't care. I know some people like that now, hallelujah, but I mean, they're not really, they're in a funny form. But he was totally sane, but that, he was living in the spirit and living and communing with God by the spirit. God would whisper, he would hear. God would give an unction, he would pick it up. He was a spiritual man, but when, the, when he sinned, the dominant nature, the spiritual nature fell, and it became subject to an alliance between the soul and the body that the Bible calls the flesh. And the flesh began to lead man. And that's when man became natural and not spiritual. Unable to discern what God is doing. Unable to understand God's plan. Unable to communicate with God. In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, it says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. The battle going on inside of you is between your flesh and your spirit. Same with me. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great, great Christian. 
example of discipleship in his famous work, The Cost of Discipleship, said, when all is said and done, the life of faith is nothing if not an unending struggle of the spirit with every available weapon against the flesh. The life of discipleship is learning to defeat the flesh by the spirit. That's the mark of a true disciple. And that's all that discipleship is. It's imperative that we gain control over this flesh nature and we begin to live by the Spirit. Because the thing of it is, is you cannot commune with God except by your spiritual nature. Jesus said in John 14, I'm the way and the truth and the life. The word he used for life there is the Greek word zoe. It means the spiritual life. Jesus came to reconnect you to the Spirit of God, to give you that communion back to give you that ability to hear God, understand him, follow him, to restore our spiritual nature because it's by the spirit that we know the things of God. It's by the spirit. I know that I'm saved. How do you know God? Because I know, because I know, because I know. Come on, somebody. I don't know how I know. I just know. The nature of spiritual knowledge is it's intuitive. It bypasses the reasoning mind, which is the problem in natural man, and it goes direct to the heart. You know God's near. You know he's in it because you know, because you know, because you know, and you're nowhere in your spiritual man. In Romans 2, 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will. In other words, the mind proves. The mind that knows the word, knows the spirit, will never ask you to do anything that's contrary to what's written in the word. And so when you get this unction in your spirit, if you get this unction in your spirit to get rid of your wife and get a younger one, I'm pretty sure you ain't hearing from the spirit of God. Can I get a witness out of somebody? Because that ain't in the word. Hallelujah. Amen. So the mind is able to prove this feeling that you have this, this pulling that you have, is it of God or is, is the enemy trying to send you a false signal? Well, the renewed mind that knows the word can say that's absolutely of God because I can tell you where that is in chapter and verse. Come on, somebody. The word and the spirit working together. The spirit knows and the mind proves. And that brings me to kind of what I want to talk to you about, the imperative of spiritual harmony. Man, I got a revelation about this. In James 5, 17, it talks about Elijah. We're living in the days of Elijah. What does that mean? Well, Elijah was in his nature a man just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain in the land for the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and he broke a drought. Elijah was just a man, but he was more than just a man. He was a spiritual man. He was in tune with God. He picked up the vibe. He called down fire, and it consumed the sacrifice. God said, go live in the wilderness, and the ravens will feed you. He left. He went out in the wilderness. God said, go do this. God said, go to that king who wants to kill you. And he said he will if he sees you and say, hey, how you doing? Are you kidding me? You've got to have the vibe. You've got to know you're hearing from God. You have to know that that's God putting that in your spirit. And you're obedient to go and do it. And he went and confronted Ahab and he says, you're a wicked king and God is going to kill you. You got to have that confidence that you're in tune with God. And we're living in these days of these signs. The greatest sign of all the signs is that the signs are converging. Let me say that one more time. The greatest sign of all the signs of Christ's return are that the signs are converging. If you haven't been studying the signs, where have you been, man? The Smitas, which we're going to have the day of release on September the 13th. We're about to see the, the Smita affect our financial market. The blood moons. We're going to have a super moon on the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, Mark Bilt says it best. What happens when we lost the feast, the great tragedy, when we lost the feast, when the church lost its concept of the feast, it lost God's calendar. And when it lost God's calendar, it lost its ability to figure out what God is doing. Because what God is doing is very precise. It's been prophesied for several thousand years, and it's right on time. Are you in step with it? Or is it going to freight train you? If you're unaware of what God is doing, you're going to react incorrectly. 
You go to fear? How many of you are fearful? The times we're living in. There's one, Anna. There's a few honest ones, hallelujah, in here. That's awesome. I, I hate to tell you, that's the wrong vibe. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of joy, love, and song mind. If we're feeling fear, and we all have to work against that, if we're feeling fear, then we're picking a signal up from the enemy. He wants us to be fearful and overreact. God wants us to be calm and assured and understand what he's doing and participate in his plan to bring the covenants to pass. Amen? So <clears throat> we're in this time of the Smitas, the blood moons, the rise of the one world Babylonian system. I haven't got time to teach on this. You're going to have to come to MTI if you want to know about the Babylonian system, but it's rising right around us. The one world financial, political, religious system is rising around us right now. The fulfillment of Sir Isaac Newton's riddle. How many of you are familiar with Sir Isaac Newton's riddle? Sir Isaac Newton was a great physicist, the father of physics. He lived in the 1600s, to early 1700s. He was a pretty cool dude because he was a, not only did he discover gravity, that was kind of important. They tell me that's important. I don't know anything about physics, but they say that's important. He discovered gravity and everything else, but he also was an avid Bible student. And he absolutely was devoted to the study of the prophetic word. He's the first guy that really uncovered the Smita in the church and understood that he, he actually had proven mathematically that Jesus was born on a Smita year and that he was crucified on a Smita year. I suggest there's a chance he may come back on a Smith here. Just, I'm just saying, I don't know. But <clears throat> his greatest, the thing that, that was really cool is here's what he said. Go to, can you flip, up to, flip to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25? Daniel 9, verse 25. I want to just talk about this for a minute. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Most of you don't know where Daniel is because it's a bummer to read Daniel. Daniel's deep and confusing, hallelujah. God gave Daniel a prophecy that timed the appearances of the Messiah, Christ, of the Israel's Messiah to the day. Verse 25, therefore no one understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. That's when we start the timer. The command goes forth to restore and build Jerusalem. Until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now the word there for weeks just means sevens. So there should be, there should be seven sevens of years and 62 sevens of years. And the street shall be built again, the wall, and even some troublesome time. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. I'm not going to go any further. But so, so this is the way I've always been taught. In 444 B.C., in the month of March, there was a king in Persia who had dominion over the territory of Jerusalem, and his name was Artaxerxes. Don't name your kids Artaxerxes. No one will be able to pronounce it. Hallelujah. Amen. And he issued a decree. It's in Nehemiah chapter 2. And he issued a decree to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, everybody goes, well, Ezra was already out there under the previous king, Cyrus. He had already gone out there, and he was building the temple. But you see, in those times, you don't have a city unless you have the walls up. The walls is what makes you a city because you can protect yourself against the enemy. And they were trying to rebuild the temple, and the enemy would attack them and burn down what they'd built. And, and Nehemiah, being a great you know, organizer, said, wouldn't it be better if we put the walls up first and then rebuilt the temple? Hallelujah. Amen. That sound good? So he goes to the king, who's a confidant of his, and the king says, why are you? He's a cupbearer. That means the king really trusted him. He drank all the wine to see if there was poison in it. I don't know what that job paid, but... I'd be wanting to leave town too, amen, you know? So he went to the king and he said, I, why are you so cast down? And he said, Jerusalem, my city is in ruins. And he said, well, what will it take to get it out of ruins? He said, you're going to have to issue a decree and let me go out there and buy some lumber and rebuild the wall. He said, okay. And he issued a decree to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, 444 B.C. in the month of March. Now you take that, and we got that date not from the Bible. We got that date from secular historians 
who documented the kings of Persia. So we start the clock ticking, and we take 62 sevens, which is 434 years. My wife tells me she's much better at math than I am. 434 years, but you've got to remember in the Jewish calendar, there are 360 days, not 365. So you multiply 434 times 360, and you come up with, and you've got so many 100,000 days, and you divide that, and you, you, got, you can actually go on Google. They have a little program called Days Between Dates, and you enter the first date, 444 B.C., March, whatever it is, 15th, and then you enter, you add that many days to it that you just came up from doing the calculation that you got out of the book of Daniel, 925, and you add those days and you come up with the spring of 33 A.D., the date of Passover that year. See how much better this goes when you use God's calendar? You begin, begin to figure out what he's doing the very day that Christ was crucified. What does that mean, God? What it means is some dude pro prophesied the day of Christ's crucifixion 700 and some odd years in advance. He pro prophesied the exact day. So that leaves us some credibility to the rest of the prophecy. So what about this other seven? There's 62 sevens, and there are seven sevens. And so the seven weeks of years, I've always been told, is the tribulation, I mean, is, 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 is some time period kind of floating through history. And there are several applications of it, but here's what Newton believed. He said that there are going to be two decrees to rebuild Jerusalem in history. Now, you've got to remember, when Newton was alive, Israel was not a country. The Jews were scattered all through Europe and everywhere. So you had to believe in Amos that Israel would be reestablished as a nation. And he believed there would be a second decree to rebuild Jerusalem. But he believed that there was a colony that they had called the Americas or America that would become a nation and it would be instrumental in the rebuilding of Jerusalem in the initiating of the second sevens, the, the second set of years, the seven sevens, and that it would have responsible, it would be responsible for initiating the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and it would be responsible for Christ coming and by turning its back on Jerusalem. So it would be a friend to Jerusalem, to Israel in the beginning of the seven sevens, and at the end of the seven sevens, it would turn its back on Jerusalem. So the fulfillment of Joel chapter three, this brother knows his word. He don't just study apples. He knows his word. He knows that in Joel 3, it says that all the nations have turned their back on Israel. And so this nation that was Israel's friend for that seven of sevens has to turn its back on Israel, and that's when Messiah would come back. So let's do some math. 49, seven sevens is 49. We're staying with 360 because that's God's calendar. We multiply 49 times 360, we get 17,600 and. 40. I don't need a calculator. I got her. So we go to June 7th, 1967, which was the last Jubilee when they had the six day war. And on that very day, on that very day, Israel conquered the west half of Jerusalem and regained control of Jerusalem for the first time in history since the, since 70 AD. That's a long time in fulfillment of the prophecy, and the clock starts of the, seven, the second group of seven sevens. And you add 17,640 days to June 7th, 1967, and you get September the 23rd of the year 2015. That's the Day of Atonement. That is the day that the Jubilee begins. Newton died when... America was not even a nation. And he said America would become a country, would facilitate the second decree to rebuild Jerusalem and would be the last nation to turn its back on Israel and usher in the Messiah. Just so happens it's on the very day of atonement, the day of the beginning of the last jubilee, in the middle of the blood moon cycle while the Babylonian system is starting to rise on the earth. Man, that's just coincidental, isn't it? 
Don't tell me you can't use eschatology to witness to the lost. Because if they've got a calculator, you can show them the accuracy of God's word. Amen? Now, I don't know if Carol and I talked about this. And we've got, we got a lot of things we have to do. We've got to get the Psalm 83 war out of the way. That's coming up real quick. You may see that before the month is out. And that facilitates the Ezekiel 38-39 war, which sets up the Antichrist. I mean, we have a lot of things we've got to get done here. But what if, Newton, what if Newton's prophecy, what if Daniel was seeing the season of Jesus' return? What if he was talking about the beginning of the events that begin to happen, that usher in the Messiah and bring him? They say that in Iran, people are spotting a physical appearance of Jesus. There is a revival in Elam, which is the ancient name for Iran, spreading through the heart of Islam because people are reporting that they are seeing Jesus. What, 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 if, that's, what if that's this season we're entering into when, hey, what if we come to church one Sunday and Jesus goes, I think I'm going to go visit them. And he's here in spirit already, but he manifests himself. He'd be sitting back there with Joseph hiding under that tree right back over there. What if, what if, what if the riddle, Newton's riddle was the beginning of the season of his return? Amen? There is so much evidence of that, it's unbelievable. So, so, so what, what, what's that got to do with, what's that got to do with being in harmony. Man, we're living in a time when you better be tuned in. Come on, somebody. You better, be, you better be understanding and following what God is doing and be following. You know what, I'm, what we got to do with these revelations? We got to preach the gospel, man. We got to start to witness to people. We got to get our life right so we can be a witness. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little about the physical world being a type and shadow of the spiritual world. I'm going somewhere with this, so you just need to bear with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 through, not 44 through 19, it's 44 through 49, I imagine. There was a natural body, Paul said, and there was a spiritual body. So it's written, the first Adam began a living being, the last Adam became a living spirit. He's talking about Jesus. First there was the natural, then there's the spiritual. However, the spiritual is not first, the natural and afterwards the spiritual. So the, the type, the way with God is first in the natural, then in the spiritual. First he brings you, breaks the drought with natural rain, then he sends you spiritual rain. First he sent the natural man, then he sends the spiritual man. So this is the pattern with God. First in the natural, then in the spiritual. The natural is the type and shadow of what's coming in the spiritual. As was the man of dust, so are also we're made of dust. And is the heavenly man, that'd be Jesus, so we're also heavenly. That's we're spiritual and natural all at the same time. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also bear the image of the heavenly man. So, so get this concept that Jesus used the spiritual. He used the natural to explain the spiritual a lot. There would be a sower sowing seed. And Jesus said, see that guy? That seed is like the word. Some of it falls on hard ground, some of it falls on weedy ground, some of it falls on good ground. And he taught the parable of the sower. In the, all the parables, a pearl, the kingdom of God is like, and then he would use a natural thing to describe the kingdom of God. So I'm going to use a natural phenomenon to try to get you to understand a spiritual principle. Are you ready? If I lose you, just go on to sleep. I'll wake you up when the service is over. I want to talk to you about a phenomenon called harmonic resonance. Harmonic resonance. Harmonic resonance is an extraordinary, diverse, and varied phenomenon seen in countless forms throughout the universe. From gravitational orbit of resonances to electromagnetic oscillations to acoustical vibrations in solids and liquids and so on and so forth. Basically, the way it works is like this. If I had my guitar here, I could take my guitar and I could get it right up close to Dylan's guitar because they're tuned exactly the same and I could strike the G string. And when I strike the G string enough, his guitar would begin to pick up that vibration and his G string on his guitar will begin to vibrate like mine is on my guitar. 
This is the spiritual life. Magnetic, it's, it's, it's harmonic resonance. It's when you are in a condition so that when God's tone comes out, something inside you begins to vibrate. Come on, somebody. You begin to resonate with the will of God. You begin to resonate what God is doing. You begin to have a knowing in your knower that you didn't have before. The G string has been hit. The F string, whatever it is, the, the A string, the B string, it doesn't matter. You're tuned exactly like the source. And so when you get that tone from the source, you begin to feel something inside. You begin to resonate like that guitar string. Is this making sense to you? This is called harmonic resonance. Resonate means that you take that vibration deep inside of yourself. This is the spiritual life. Now, the resonating of the, 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 the tone of God that we pick up first begins to change us from the inside out. It begins to transform us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we're being transformed into God's very image from glory to glory as by the Spirit, by the tone of God, by that cosmic tone of God. We get where we can sense it, we pick it up, we begin to resonate with it, it begins to reorder our life. Now I'm going to show you a clip here of an example of harmonic resonance through a tone and what it does spontaneously in the, in the natural and then I'm going to make a physical point, I mean a spiritual point, and try to get you to understand what you're looking at.
Amen. You notice as the frequency increased, the complexity began to change. As you, we're, we're spending so many resources in the church trying to make you behave and to make you different and make you live by the law. And we're missing this important point of harmonic resonance. If we can get you to pick the signal up and get in the presence of God and get to that place where you can begin to sense him and that tone of the Holy Spirit begins to resonate inside of you, the inside of you begins to become transformed. It's not about legalism and law. It's about the presence of the Holy Spirit. As you get where you can resonate, you can sense that. That plate begin to sense the change in that, in that frequency and that those metal filings will begin to reorganize. See, most of us come to church and our life is a disheveled mess. But when the tone of the Holy Spirit begins to vibrate and resonate in our life, things begin to organize and change and move and doors open and we, well, our life becomes reordered in the Spirit of God. Can I get a witness out of somebody? This is, the, this is what Jesus came to bring you. He didn't come to bring you a religion. He never used the word religion. He came to plug you into that tone so your life begins to metamorpho is the word for transform. You begin to go through a metamorphous process spiritually. Does this make sense to you now? And so the other illustration he used is he said, the Holy Spirit is like living water. In John chapter 7, he said, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Living water. Water that's alive. Water that's under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Water that is different than other water. Water that flows, but it flows the way the Spirit tells it to go. And I got one more illustration of harmonic resonance, of spiritual, this is physical, but it's exactly a mimic of the spiritual, of living water. So let's watch this. Isn't that amazing? You should be so in tune with the Holy Spirit that he can reverse your direction just by changing the tone, just by changing the frequency just a little bit. And that water, 
is living water. It's alive. It's doing something water doesn't do. It's responding to the spiritual tone. Is this making sense to you? You're living in a time where there are signs of his coming everywhere. And God has said that I am going to take care of you and you're going to be blessed in this time. But you have to be hooked into that frequency. You have to be following that vibration. You've got to be picking up his vibe and not the vibe of other things in your life. Is this making sense to you now? Are you understanding how the spirit vibrates and resonates in you? It's how you know the things of God because there's just something in you you pick up. I was out on the ranch gathering calves the other day, and I've been ready for this smita, and I've got plans of, uh, of what I was going to do in the smita, and, and we were just about done, and I got a phone call from Cass, maybe a text, and Mark is off 1,058 points. And I go, golly, I'm out here chasing cows around, and I missed the whole thing. And I got this real anxiousness. And then I got where I could pray. You know why you're not in tune? See, it's not that you're not in tune because you're not in covenant. I want to warn you what Jesus said about covenant. It ain't going to get you there. He told the Jews, he said, you may, you may be sons of Abraham, but even he can make the rocks cry out and praise him. You know, just because you're in covenant doesn't mean that you're following the vibe. Come on, somebody. And when I got to where I could get still and get quiet and pray and say, God, have I missed it? What about it? I got this vibe. I got this, this sense that it was not, this was counterfeit. This wasn't the real deal. I didn't need to worry about it. I just needed to wait. And, I, and, I, and so I had several days. It took several days to get everything done. I had to get done to do what I wanted to do. And so I would get anxious and I would pray and God would, I begin to sense that vibe. It's not too late. You're okay. You're right on. And, 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 and I got it put where exactly where I want. I got done exactly what. I wanted to get done. But how quickly did I get out of that vibe? <sighs> what steals it? Busyness. You're too darn busy. If you're, if you're living in a time when you're too busy to pray or read your word, good luck to you, man. Because you're not going to respond to that. That thing's not working inside of you, and you're on your own, and you're on your own in a time when there are landmines everywhere. And so we have to make sure that we're tuned in. You see, if I take Dylan's guitar and take my guitar again, and I strike that E string again, if his E string is a half a turn out of, out of pitch, if he turns that, if that thing starts vibrating, he can reach up and he can turn that tuning key until it stops. Because when he gets out of sync and gets out of tune, it's no longer responding to that vibration. Is this making sense to you? And the problem in the church we have today is not that people don't love Jesus. It's not that they uh, don't love the church. And it's not that they're not pretty good people. It's they're not in tune spiritually. I don't want to pray in tongues. Well, I'm not trying to make you pray in tongues, but I'm going to tell you this right now. If you're scared of the spiritual gifts, you're tuned. Your tuning key is not going to get there. You've got to pursue everything that's spiritual. You have to pursue everything in this book that's pursuing. I want the gifts. I want the baptism. I want it all. I want everything that's spiritual because I want my tuning to be so precise that he can just barely send a signal and I can pick it up. And this is really the problem with sin. See, we've done such a good job teaching grace in this church every church, the church at large. And your sin is not going to probably get you into burning hell. I can't guarantee that, but I doubt that it is. If you accepted Jesus, because the blood of the sacrifice will cover you and you'll be justified and you'll get through the pearly gates. But your life will be a smoldering mess when you finally get there because your sin has kept you from being in tune with the Spirit. It's not an issue of right and wrong. It's not an issue of you making me happy or, or, or me telling you how to live your life. It's an issue, are you in a condition of dikaiosene, the Greek word for correctness before God, righteousness. Are you in the condition to where you're in tune because you're living in a mind field. And you need that. When he says reverse, that you back up. When he says go left, you go left. When he says go right, you go right. 
so he can guide you through the times that we're living in. Harmonic resonance. The Spirit of God has got to be something that you get around and you just begin to pick it up. <laughs> How many churches are there that are meeting across the United States this morning where there's ever been any spirit to resonate with? <laughs> All I want you to do is I just want you to make it in these times. And here's what I'm here to tell you. God said, I'll keep you from the hour of trial. But not if you're doing your own thing. I had a blue heater dog one time. In my life, I've had several blue heater dogs. In fact, this is a trait with all of them. When they're up in the yard or around the pens working, they mind real good. Because they know you can, you can get to them and you can drown them if you, you, know, you catch them. You, they know that they can't get completely away. But you go out to gather cattle and it's already, see you later, sucker. I'm out of here. And they'll be out there driving cattle the wrong direction and everything in the world because they can't hear you. You're screaming and hollering and they intentionally get outside of earshot. That way they can't hear a thing you're saying so they can tell you, I'm innocent, man. I just didn't hear you. That's the way a lot of Christians are living. They've gotten out of earshot of God. They've gotten where they no longer resonate with the Holy Spirit, and they're doing their own thing, and they're going, I didn't hear God say none of that to me. That's because you ain't listening. You're not in tune. Come on, somebody. You've got to get in tune. Get your life in tune. You've got to get your life in tune with the Holy Spirit so that you know because you know because you know that every step you take has been ordered of God. Hmm. And, and, and folks, you're, we're all going to have to get rid of our sin issues because it's throwing our, our pitch off. We just got to get rid of it. Is this making sense to you? If you're not dialed in, in the time that we're living in, you're going to be distracted by problems. You're going to have fear. That's the other thing I always ask people about the times we're living in. I asked you earlier, are you fearful? If you're fearful, you got to get retuned because you're not really tuned into what God is doing. I have a lot of guys come to me and they say, you know what, Pastor, I'm just having a hard time with this whole, I'm not, you know, I'm not hearing God. Well, how much, you, are you reading the Word? No, nah, I've been busy. You pray. I'm having trouble in my, in my marriage. You pray with your wife? Nah, I don't pray with her. What do you want me to do? What exactly do you want me to do? Because I can't tune you. You've got to tune yourself. Come on, somebody. What, when you decide you're going to be in tune with that resonant spirit of God, that you're going to pick that vibe up and you're going to stay in that place where you're hearing his voice, you know what you're going to end up doing? You're going to end up getting hungry for the word and you're going to figure out a way to do it. I'm going to tell you something Rodney says all the time. You do the things you want to do and you make excuses for the rest. Don't come to me and tell me you don't have time to read the word because you've got 168 hours in your week just like I've got 168 hours in mine. What you're saying is it's not a priority for you. That's okay. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm going to love on you anyhow. But don't come to me and say, oh, God, my life is a mess. When you have not tried to stay in tune with what he's, come on, somebody. He sends that signal out, and everybody who's on that frequency picks it up. But when you're on another frequency, because you're worried about the natural life, whatever, you miss it. All I want, to, I want this church to do is to decide that we are going to stay in sync with what God is doing. That we're going to do the spiritual disciplines of in the word, prayer. We're going to fast occasionally. We're going to seek God before we make big decisions. We're going to trust God after we make those decisions. Made, you've made a lot of mistakes in the past, haven't you? So have I. That doesn't mean a thing to God. What frequency are you on now? That's all he cares about. He doesn't care what frequency you've been living your life on. What frequency are you on now? Do you understand the trans transforming, leading power of the Holy Spirit now through these illustrations? And here's the thing. You just get on the right frequency and God will reorder your life. Just let that work. Just like those filings on that plate. Just let him work. He's changing you into somebody else. I really worried about using these illustrations because, you know, just sometimes people think that's not spiritual enough, but it's very spiritual.